we again sit down for a conversation we call Attempted Intelligence. This time, I'm trying to build on the concept of that autofill. Okay. Right? Remember we were talking about ontology, and right. if your ontology includes something a priori or that can, which can be known without sensing, so it's always there. It's like opening <coughs> uh, an internet form, and there's something that's filled in, and you cannot get rid of it. It's always there, whether you're able to observe it or not. Now, the details that I'm going to point more so to to explain this are going to be within the field of osteopathy. Doesn't mean it's the only place we're going to go, but it's the place I plan to talk about details. But we can easily be derailed. I'm well known for that. Okay. <laughs> so, the idea that you can have something in your world or in your thought process, a priori, mm -hmm. that which can be known without sensing, <clears throat> is like an autofill. It's ontological, it's a categorization. So it's a category within a classification system which you apply to everything. Okay. Okay. Now I sent you a link which you admittedly didn't look into too deeply, which okay. Totally understandable. It doesn't mean we can't have the conversation, right? It's not like, oh, well, you didn't read chapter and verse. <laughs> or, well, neither did that, but <laughs> I know the concept and I can wield it well. Right. The concept was theory induced blindness. Do you have some description of theory induced blindness? Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to say the title is really good. <laughs> <laughs> the, like, Right, for, for it to come first to mind, no. I, okay. don't, I don't have anything that just sure. pops out. So, the question that you posed to me off camera was essentially what, well it wasn't really a question, it was an observation that you had. That when you looked at it very briefly, it reminded you of looking something else up. Okay. What did it, so the, I'll give something very simple about theory induced blindness. Essentially, you have a theory, right, or you have some process that you will apply, thought process that you will apply to multiple situations, mm -hmm. and because you apply it, you're unable to detect when it is or it isn't working, right? You're, you're just not really able to detect it. Right. It's, it's, it's the right. It's right. right. It's, you believe it a priori. You believe without requiring observation that the theory is correct for the situation, oh, okay. right? So it's like the autofill. Right. So when you have that autofill, when you have that a priori concept, whether, because it's always there, you can't detect when it's not. Yeah, okay? no, that's fair. So that's, hopefully that makes sense. So essentially maybe to condense it, theory induced blindness is when you are unable to think outside of the theory such that you can't detect when it's inappropriate for the situation. Yes. Right? Now, it made you think of something, and what was that? Um, <clears throat> it was um, a phrase or terminology that says self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. And when I was looking this up, it was in terms of meeting meeting a, a stranger in the first impressions. So if um, me and a co-worker are getting introduced to you mm -hmm. in an outside context, so I've met you and then I go tell my co-worker, hey, watch out for Sam, Sam's a real jerk. That you can say the other thing you said. It's not going to hurt my feelings because it's this is hypothetical. Hypothetical, but I did say asshole off camera. But yes, so um, but just any impression really, mm -hmm. whether it's good or bad. Yeah, that's... whatever it is, you you've preloaded it. Right. So that's the term that you used was preloaded. So I've almost preloaded my coworker mm -hmm. with an impression of you. So uh, when I was reading it, it said it's almost like that person can only find things that fill that characteristic yes. when they're looking and yes. talking to you. So they're waiting for you to yep. be an asshole and you know, so, doing this fulfilling prophecy. Something that I've said, if you consider epistemologies, they have different views of truth, different views of reality. Fair? Yep. Great. The idea being that regardless of what you believe is true, how you describe it, eventually if you if you take a large enough view, it's all pointing at something that's obligate. It's all pointing to something deeper. There's different superficial interpretations. It's hard to argue against that, that you and I would interpret the exact same event with at least some shade of difference. If we went down the list and we asked each one of us very specified questions, there would be some divergence, right? right? So it's very hard for that not to be the case. So it's like, well, those are different realities. 
they are generated by the same obligate phenomenon. However, the way we communicate them has some divergence and some difference, right? But if you... So, in saying that, the concept of a priori knowledge, right? So that which can be known without sensing, right? The concept of uh, essentially that autofill type of deal, the concept of theory-induced blindness, mm -hmm. right? My theory makes it hard for me to see anything else. And then self-fulfilling prophecy. So your example being priming somebody with information prior to them observing the phenomenon, right? It's hard to see the phenomenon without that priming. That describes all of those things. They are different descriptions, they come from different angles, but they seem to be pointing at the same phenomenon. Right. That <clears throat> if you have something in your head before, you could call it prejudge, right, or prejudging, right. right? However you, you know, appropriately like to say right. whatever. But the idea is that previous knowledge informs you in the new situation. It is extremely difficult to escape that. If you are human, mm -hmm. the way that your cognition is likely to work is if you have something loaded into the system, you're going to utilize it, you're going to find it more often than not. You know, it's like you'll find what you're looking for no matter what it is. Kind of deal. Yeah. I, I think there's a more common way to say that, okay. but it's not popping into my head more. That being said, if you're dealing with a professional setting, if you're dealing with a clinical setting, where somebody comes in with some form of issue, regardless of severity, they report it to you and your job is to interpret it and in intervene to their benefit, right? So you have skills, you're supposed to be able to assess something, figure out what the heck to do with it, apply that, and then ideally get a positive result. Right. If you have a system that has a priori knowledge, is it possible that because you can't detect when that a priori knowledge is present, that or present or not present, that you're just going to go forward with your a priori knowledge and not even notice when it's useless. Is it possible that you will do that and go forward? No matter what, and not even notice when it's useless. Yes. Okay. That's the grounding of the whole deal, right? So. Osteopathy as a profession, hands-on profession, easy way to say it, it's body mechanics, right? We identify what is moving and what is not moving in the body. We're able to change it on some level. That's the that's the mode of interface, okay. right? I look at what's moving, I look at what's not moving. Regardless of how fancy somebody wants to describe it, that's the root. Right. The phenomenon is motion, right. right? People will talk about very minute motions, which are questionable. Uh, They'll talk about gross motions, and then it's like, oh, gross motions, oh, yes, the large motions, the structural. You're, you know, you're just a, I don't know, like, basically you're a boor. You're, you're unsophisticated, because <laughs> right, right. you can't feel the minute stuff. I'm like, well, you can't either. So, <laughs> so, anyways, the a priori concept within osteopathy, the autofill, is that health and disease states have mechanical correlates, right? So, health is evidenced by good motion of all structures. Okay. Disease is noted superficially, externally, with some form of problem with motion, some identifiable problem with motion. Okay. That's why you have your disease, right? That's why the disease process is occurring. So if you believe that, is it going to be difficult to identify when that's not the thing that's driving the disease process. Yes. Is it going to be almost impossible? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> the pitfall, when you believe the central dogma, when you believe the central a priori concept, is that when you can't, you can't detect when it's not the driver, are you aware that there is essentially no known anatomical specimen that is perfectly even side to side, perfectly symmetrical? Sorry. Say the question again. Are you aware yeah. of, okay, maybe this is a more appropriate question because it's obviously leading, but are you, are you aware of an anatomical specimen that is perfectly symmetrical side to side? No. Thank you. Okay, so you're just, you're just not aware of it. Yeah. But are you aware of many anatomical specimens? Yes. Okay, but do you, have you ever studied them deeply? No. Okay, fair enough. So, 
are all of your organs paired structures? Are they? Do you all have a mirror of each organ? No. Some organs are asymmetrical. No. Is your? Do you have? I'm just. You're not an anatomical expert. Right. Are your lungs symmetrical? Do they have the same shape and the same number of lobes? I'm I'm going to assume yes. Okay. No. Okay. They don't. Right. Yeah. Okay. Do you have two livers? No. Not that we know. <laughs> there might be somebody up there, but we don't know. Uh, the do you do you oh, what was the movie uh, Ninja Assassin? Okay. Do you remember when they're here? Do you remember that one? Like right at the beginning. Okay. And, yeah. the, and there's a tattoo artist. Yeah. Who didn't die when they came to kill him? Uh yeah. Do you remember why he didn't die? Wasn't he like born with his heart on the other side or something? Yes. The term is situs inversus. Okay. Your organs are flipped. So the opposite, like everything just, is opposite. Yeah, they're on the opposite side. Uh, I believe there may be cases where some organs are flipped and others are not. Okay. But generally speaking, they're just flipped, right? So that is a thing, right? So you expect it to be in one place. Odds are that it's going to be in that place when it's not always there. So just the reality that organs are not, organs themselves, the things inside, are not the same size and shape, side to side, and they're built to be that way, that is asymmetrical, right? The... There are, I've never seen a bony specimen that is even side to side. So if you take a single vertebrae from a single skeleton and you look side to side, it's not symmetrical. And it's visibly, to the naked eye, not symmetrical. Okay. Do you think that's, that because they're not the same size and shape, that would affect the external visual identification or palpatory identification of equal motion? Would it affect it? Yeah, so if your bones are not the same size and shape side to side, mm -hmm. should I expect you to be able to move the exact same side to side? No. I shouldn't expect it. And it's known that that's normal. Okay. If you do not know that, if you do not know that, would you, and you did believe that there's a mechanical correlate to health and disease states, mm -hmm. anytime you saw asymmetrical motion, would you think that that was an automatic indicator of something that was driving a disease process? If it wasn't uh, equal side to side, side to side. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Now, when somebody tells you because you believe there are health, there are mechanical correlates to health and disease states. If somebody tells you that it is very normal for actual bones and actual muscles on the same person to be asymmetrical side to side upon some form of examination, be it some image, autopsy, dissection, whatever. Does, and you already believe that there are mechanical correlates to health and disease state, are you going to, how are you going to take in the fact that it's well known, that it's normal, that people are, are unevenly shaped? I'm going to just if I already know the previous information, yep. I just feel like I'm gonna. It's gonna con. It's gonna conflict in my brain. I feel like you're gonna. I'm gonna call you wrong. So you're just. You're gonna say, well, of course they're asymmetrical. It's because they had diseases. That's why they died. Is that? Yeah. Pretty okay. Much. That's kind of how you feel. Yeah, yeah. That's what I observe. Right. I don't observe. Oh, so this is actually the common normal state. This is the normal state, right? Do you know anybody who doesn't die of some form of, you know, what could be termed a disease state? Do you know what the number one killer of humans is? Would it be disease? But, like, there's a specific <laughs> one. Uh, no, no. Cardiac disease. Huh. <laughs> when your heart stops working, it's, be yes. it's because it's disease. It's disease. It's not functioning properly, right? It's like, oh, so the terms are weird? Yeah. Right? Like, it's <laughs> cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of humans. <laughs> it's like, so I, my heart's either messed up or I can't get the blood around. Yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I would guess that's what it is. Yeah, right? yeah, that's when the heart stops beating and the, the pulses can't do the work. But yeah, I guess I'd die. So the problem, the problem that I'm pointing to, is that a priori knowledge that when confronted with something new, that is actually normal and observable, you want to find it. Yeah. Right now, obviously in the abstract, I brought you to the place and said, "Well, what would you do with that?" You're like, well, "I don't know. I feel like I'd want to fight you." <laughs> <laughs> that's what I observe. Yeah. When confronted with new knowledge. People that I observe within the osteopathic profession, 
have some pushback right. because they there is some small information, small in number of people studied, small in number of people spoken to, that essentially suggests that osteopathic practitioners shy away from measurable things. They say think it's not uncommon to hear things like science can't measure osteopathy. Yeah. It's not uncommon. And then they, there is a preference for the experiential the, the experiential quality of the patient's interface with the practitioner. So I'm trying not to like the experience of the experience, right? But essentially what they focus on, what they put value on is the patient's experience. The patient's like, oh, I feel better. Okay. They say that to you. Right. Some people are polite. But doesn't that mean as the practitioner, if I'm working on something <clears throat> and the patient feels better, mm -hmm. would I not associate what I did with actually making them feel better and fixing the problem? But they happen at the same time, temporal correlation, right? Right. So here's the deal. I, as a practitioner, have objectively found motion issues with patients. I've objectively done my best to change them. There's been minimal to no change, and the person turns around and tells me they feel fantastic. Right? So I'm like, oh, there's two different scales at play. Right. Remember constructs, the idea of constructs? Yeah. So there's the as objective as I can be construct of using motion right. and checking it with symmetrical and doing something about that and changing that or not changing it. So there's a measurement there. Right. But then the patient has their scale of, I like this. This felt good. Right. There is evidence to suggest that elderly COPD patients, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients, have been studied. So they got osteopathic treatment. They were, they had their essentially air trapping. There's different measures of air trapping, but how much air gets trapped in the lung. There's, again, there's different measures, so I'm not, I can't pick the proper measure off the top of my head, but they objectively, after osteopathic treatment, have worse or higher air trapping. So they're actually breathing worse. objectively worse, okay. but they almost all report positive outcomes. They're like, I feel really good. So they objectively breathe poorly right. or more poorly than they were already breathing poorly because right. they were already breathing poorly. Right. But they, the other scale, the patient scale, they feel good, right? So if I take the patient report as my evidence then of my interface impacting the mechanical correlates of health and disease states, then I'm going to prefer the patient report as opposed to the objective, right? right? I tend to say they're both at play. Because I've seen when the, the scale that I use, which is motion, objectively changes very poorly, but the patient reports positive. Right. I tell patients <clears throat> explicitly, there's two scales at play. There's mine and there's <clears throat> yours. Yours is always more important than mine, right. no matter what I want to say or do. Right? So again, there's that a priori knowledge. There's that idea that it's always there, right? whether I can observe it or not. Right? So if I don't observe a gross motion problem, a large identifiable motion problem, and I believe that there are mechanical correlates to health and disease states, what am I likely to say? So I don't find it. So you, you don't see anything? I don't see the big ones. But I know for sure that there's a motion problem. Where do I start looking? What do I start doing? If you don't see a gross one, but you know there's a motion problem? No, no, <clears throat> I believe there has to be a motion problem because this person has a disease symptom. What do I do? <laughs> Well, wouldn't you just, like, almost like you would find something. Like, you would just find it. Like, but it's, it's that. Okay. Now, so if I'm convinced that there is a motion problem, but I can't find it on the large scale, do I have to go to the small scale? Yeah. Human palpation doesn't do good things. <laughs> right? It just, it just doesn't. So you have these concepts that are populated by looking for very small motions, and they say it's very sophisticated palpation, and you know when you get really good, you'll be able to feel it. <laughs> but so they stick with the a priori, there's definitely a mechanical problem. So you'll have somebody hold the back of your head while you're laying down through a living bone. Living bone tends to be fairly thick, right? right? And you understand pressurized systems, is that fair? Think about 150 milliliters of fluid okay. 
right? That's less, considerably less than a water bottle. I think most water bottles 500. that we are able to access, your standard one is 500 yeah. and the plastic water bottle. So think about 150. So surrounding, surrounding your brain in all the small spaces okay. and then essentially going around your spinal cord. Okay. It's a low pressure system mm -hmm. believed by some to pulsate at a rate about, I believe it's about 10 to 14 times a second. Okay. Do you think you could feel that through there? I don't think so. No, because it's a low pressure system and there's not a lot of fluid. Yeah. If it's a high pressure system, right? Like, when a high pressure system is working, can you feel it moving? Because you've actually felt high pressure systems running through hoses. Can yeah. you, when it's moving, when not, it's moving. not when it's priming. Because when it's priming, how do you know? What, what do you feel? Or what do you, or what, what sense lets you know that a high pressure system is turning on? Well, there's, it's, there's something changes. So essentially yeah. it's static and then there's like a vibration or a movement. So there's, there's a shake. Yeah. Right. And then is there a noise sometimes because it's primed by a pump? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, these are not perfectly analogous, right. but a high pressure system when it's flowing, you can't always tell because it's just going. It's yeah. Right. Uh, and it's moving at a fairly high rate of speed. Is that yeah. usually usual? Right. So it's like, no, what are you talking about? You can't feel that. But again, because a priori you believe that there is a mechanical correlate to health and disease states, you can very easily go for smaller and smaller things and be convinced that that's where you'll find it. Now, if you are convinced that you can find the small stuff, you're convinced that you can find the small stuff, that you've got these fantastic hands that can find the small stuff, what are you going to do about the big stuff? Most likely going to ignore it. So I have, I have fantastic hands. Why would I need to look at the bill? <laughs> I'm sophisticated. <laughs> so I'm not necessarily trying to cast stones here because people who know what I'm talking about, the specifics that I'm pointing in the direction of are going to possibly have issues and that's fine. But I'm talking about the thought process with that autofill, with that a priori, with that self-fulfilling prophecy, which all seem to be an extremely similar phenomenon because you're convinced that it's there. So this discussion reminds me of something that you've said in several different uh, discussions and with the, it's a priority knowledge. A priori. A priori. Not priority. A priori knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, cause you said there's really no way to combat it when you're, mm -hmm. when it's already there. Yeah. Is the only thing to soften it is just that that reasonable amount of uncertainty. Of uncertainty. That's what I'd like to suggest as a possible solution. I can't prove to you that it's the right solution. I can't prove to you it's a good solution. But if you know that as a human, you can't go into a novel situation with no knowledge, because like, how would you ever know how to walk? Right. right? Like you have to carry some knowledge from previous situations right. into new situations. Just know that that could be the driver of your mistake, because you can't see right you can't forget the old knowledge long enough to notice the thing that's there. Right. You're blinded by the previous knowledge. Remember experts, yeah. right? Experts have a hard time, you know, like they, they have a hard time not seeing certain things, right? So basically they're driven down to that theory induced blindness. So they're like, well, this is the way it happens. So they just don't think outside of that. So there's this is my field. Everything's related to my field. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the, common saying to a hammer, everything looks like a nail, Yeah. right? So this phenomena is pointed to by many different things. So what I would say is it's actually normal to be blinded by your previous thoughts. Don't be upset about it. Right. Acknowledge that it is a common problem. And then it's possible that you could have enough humility by understanding that, that you walk into something and you're saying, Hey, I'm in a new situation. I'm pretty sure I'm on the right track. But I like I'm gonna maybe throw a jab out there that's not supposed to connect and see how this thing responds, right? So when I say a jab, so just throw something out there that if your previous knowledge is correct, a very predictable thing should happen, right? It's like if I throw this rock, this heavy rock onto this ice, if the ice is strong enough to support me, it should just. If it's not, it sh I should at least hear a crack. It doesn't have to go through, but if I hear a crack, I'm not going. Right. 
So you have some understanding of the amount of force that it can handle. You have some previous knowledge. Right. Now, if you throw it on, and then you don't hear any noise, and the rock disappears, like, <laughs> oh, holy shit! <laughs> like, I think I found something that I don't understand. Right. Now, if you threw a rock onto a sheet of ice, and it just there was no noise, and it just disappeared, are there some things that you would immediately jump to that would you might think of based on stuff that you've already seen? Well. I'm just I'm thinking of like instant magic, other dimension. Just yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're filling it with some stuff that you've already yeah. you've already had some introduction to because you're carrying that from, right. which is completely common right. and like it's understandable. But it's like okay, now <laughs> if this is another dimension, how would it behave if I threw this? Exactly. Right? It's like, do they like pizza? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna throw some pizza at it. <laughs> And then if the pizza just comes flying back, like, oh, they said no, there's something on the other side with intelligence. I'm going to pull a stick, see if they can grab it. Yeah, you're, yeah. Go you're going to experiment, right. right? Because right now, if you're like, it's definitely, you know, like, it's definitely explained by string theory. Yeah. Dude, you don't know string theory. <laughs> Relax. Right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Right? The, the, I think something that did that well was uh, the first Thor movie. No, it was the second Thor movie, where the there was the thing where the kid threw the kids yes. threw the stuff and just yeah. kind of kept looping through. Yeah. That was the second Thor movie, yes. right? The Dark Realm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's that that, that acting, that behavior. Mm -hmm. You're like, <laughs> what's this? Right? right. So, I think the, the the general theme, although I'm pointing towards, I'm using the detail of a mechanical correlate to, correlate to health and disease states, just pointing at osteopathy, not necessarily using the specific terms. Right. It takes you down that line of thought. Yes. Helps you understand it. Right. So if I was to suggest something, just know that it's very normal to carry previous knowledge. And just know it's often extremely useful, but there's times when it's not. So if you're at least mildly aware of that, you might have pause to question yourself in a novel situation. So the fact that it's normal <laughs> is, is fine, but you have to understand that it's normal to actually move past it. Or move. I don't know that you have to. Okay. That's the way that I've been able to experience it. So that's kind of constructivism, okay. right? My experience says when I know more, I'm a little bit less sure of stuff. Okay. Right? <laughs> so expertise reduces mistakes. Right. Because I've screwed up more. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think that's reasonable. <laughs> Anything else to add or consider? All right. Fantastic.